Welcome back, Warrior Family. Yay. Uh, we are so excited that you all have joined us for today's conversation. Yes. Yes. It, is, it was amazing. We talked to Simon Rinney. Mm-hmm. And um, before Abby hops into her recap, let me let you all know a little bit about who Simon is. Simon is a husband and father of two from Queensland's Sunshine Coast. He's a social worker with a private therapy practice dedicated to supporting men to open up about mental illness and disabilities. He's passionate about men's mental health because he has also experienced mental illness, OCD, depression, anxiety, and burnout for over 30 years. And it's taken him 20 years to finally get the help that he's needed. So, Abby, let's hear about this chat. Yes. I say it every time. And I always mean it. This was an awesome, awesome chat. I am Mm -hmm. so grateful that we connected with Simon. Um, We actually connected with Simon because of Facebook. And I just like to say that because I really don't like social media, but we find so many incredible warriors that we get to connect with. And like, it makes my heart so happy. So I like to highlight the the good pieces of social media. Mm -hmm. Um, And fun fact that Simon told us um, was that uh, we're in the week of International OCD Awareness Week. Um, And we've had two interviews this week. You all don't know it because we're spreading it out based on editing, but two interviews (laughs) this week where we're talking about OCD. So I just thought that was a really cool interview. piece about behind the scenes of the podcasting we're podcasting Mm. during the week of OCD awareness yeah that's wild (laughs) yeah right we did not plan it but it was a it was a beautiful synchronicity um so Simon starts off first by really breaking down what OCD is uh which is obsessive thoughts compulsive acts and the disorder is the uh length of time that it shows up in your day you know, he shares his journey of OCD living in the 80s and 90s where mental health and emotions weren't really spoken about and how men and boys were given the message to not seek help, to not speak about it, um, and to just shove it all down and pretend it's not there. Um, He shares a lot of really helpful strategies uh, that he's used over the years that have helped him with navigating OCD, including exposure response prevention, which I just found like that story was so super interesting. And I really, I feel like I'm going to take some of that with me. Um, and ultimately how, how, what Simon is doing now in his life, in his work, in raising his children is being the person that he wished he had growing up and how just, you know, being able to get help when it's needed to speak to a professional, to speak to friends has really transformed how he feels in his body, how he feels in the world. And it was just such a really inspiring conversation. Um, He is a a great storyteller. Um, I really enjoyed listening to his story and, um, and really enjoyed connecting with him. Mm -hmm. This was a good conversation warriors. Mm -hmm you are going to, I mean, just literally come away with so much inspiration, so many tools for yourself. Even if you have limited or no experience with OCD, maybe there are going to be, I I have to believe there are going to be notes of this conversation that are going to land for every single one of our listeners. Yes. And we know, um, we certainly can't tell it as well as Simon did. So without further ado, here's the show. Welcome back warriors. Yay. We are so excited to be joined by another awesome guest, Simon mm-hmm. Rinne. Welcome to the show. Hello. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Us too. Yes, we are super stoked. Tell, we were we were chit-chatting before we hit record that, you know, you're our third international guest. And because we're giant nerds and we're like, woo, we're talking to people from all over the world that have anxiety journeys. <laughs> Tell everyone quickly where you're from. Yeah, so I'm... Um, in Queensland, Australia, on the Sunshine Coast, um, beautiful part of the world, better than the Gold Coast. If you ever hear about Australia, people think about the Gold Coast, but we're better with the Sunshine Coast, and we're two hours up the road from the Goldie. So, I love it. <laughs> I mean, wait. the Sunshine Coast sounds perfect. Uh, yeah, yeah. Is this it is where? Perfect. Where is the Whit Sundays? Uh, further north. For so, the okay. yeah, yeah, same same state, but we're down like the southeast corner of the state. Yeah, mm-hmm. I know that's like back in the day, like 15 years ago is a hot tourist spot to go to. Mm-hmm. 
yeah, yeah. still the still still the same. Global warming's not helping with the bleaching of the coral reef. So mm. I hope I can get the kids up there one day and check it out before it all dies. Yeah. <laughs> <But> yeah. <laughs> Oh man. Well, we're starting off on a dark note, but it's just, it's so hard not to, you know, I mean, it's the reality of the, our literal earth, right? The world that we live in. So, um, Mm. great. Let's just jump into talking about anxiety now. (laughs) Uh, so Simon, um, share with our guests a little bit about our guests. Wow. Margo, we're, we're getting off to a great start. Get share with our (laughs) listeners, um, a little bit about how anxiety shows up in your life. Yeah, no worries. Thanks for that. And and happy International OCD Awareness Week as well. So oh, um, wow. my story is one that is fundamentally based in obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, and for anyone who's listening and doesn't understand what that is, it's an obsessive thought, which is quite intrusive, quite distressing, um, followed by a compulsive act to alleviate the distress and the anxiety that comes from the obsessive thought. Mm-hmm. And it's a disorder because you do it for over an hour a day. Um, but by no means don't use that as your, your criteria for your self-diagnosis. Go and get diagnosed before you start self-diagnosing. Um, but when I was about eight years old, I developed OCD. And it started off in the schoolyard. And a student said to me, Simon, if you don't talk for more than a minute, you're going to lose your voice forever. And most people would go, okay, yeah, that doesn't makes sense that's silly but I thought that that was going to happen and so I started humming to myself as the compulsive act all day every day for about two years Um, and so a huge amount of anxiety was provoked by that thought very distressing for me as an eight-year-old I didn't want to lose my voice didn't realize that monks can go years without talking and still not lose their voice (laughs) Um, but as a you don't really I didn't even know what a monk was to be honest with you um (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and yeah, so it, and, it, and it developed over my life. So I'm 39 now and I still live with OCD and, and it de- it's developed and morphed in different ways. But I guess the worst of it was in my teenage years. Um, my mum and dad separated and my, my, my little brother and I went with mum and I suddenly became the man of the house. And so I would spend hours upon hours every night with this huge fear of someone breaking into the house and stealing our stuff, hurting us, kidnapping us. And also on top of that, a huge fear of the house burning down while we were sleeping. And so these were the obsessive thoughts and the compulsive acts around that was spending hours locking and checking doors, windows, gates, was all closed and locked um, and that appliances were all off like stoves, ovens, the fridge door was properly closed the iron was off and all this type of stuff and for hours and hours and hours each night and and that one still sticks around today but I don't do it for hours and hours and hours anymore um but yeah definitely in my teens it was the worst um and also other things like when I was at school I'd I'd be constantly checking for my my wallet and my keys phones didn't exist back then well I didn't have a phone back then and this is I'm talking about the 80s and 90s and um and yeah so because I was petrified of someone getting my keys to get into the house and I was petrified of them stealing my identity and all this type of stuff. And so I would check my bag constantly and, and yeah, this one stuck around as well until like now and, and also my car as well. So I was petrified of the car rolling down a hill and, and killing someone. So I would be constantly checking the handbrake was on um to the point where I'd, I'd walk away from the car know that it was all locked up and safe and secure I could walk 20 minutes away and then have to turn around and go check it again um and so and that one still sticks around today um as a dad now that I'm a dad so I've got two little kids I don't do these things as much I think maybe because I'm just so tired of being because I'm, I'm a dad <laughs> so maybe I don't have the energy and my kids are pulling me in, in the opposite direction but certainly before kids yeah, these things were quite, quite real and distressing for me. So yeah, that's how wow. it's kind of morphed over the years. Yeah. yeah. And there's, a, there's, there's lots of other little, little things that I've done, but yeah, they're the main ones. Yeah. Wow. Well, first of all, I just want to say like, I appreciate you really breaking down, you know, what OCD is because Margo and I have talked about how it gets thrown around a lot and, mm. you know, people are like, oh, I'm so OCD about this. And it's like, Okay, yeah. wait, but that's a little different, right? And so really breaking it down into the obsessive thought, the compulsive act, and the disorder is like the length of time mm. that 
eat into your day. Yeah. Um, and I have like so many questions, but I'll try to, you know, my brain is always like, ah, them all at once. But I'll try to like <laughs> stagger them. Um, the first thing is, so it's, it's really, you know, interesting that at age eight, right. Like this person saying, you know, if you don't talk, right, this is what happens. Um, and so you start humming and I'm just wondering, like, what was the message you were getting from other people, from adults, from teachers, from your peers, when you're always humming, were you able to, you know, express like, oh, I'm humming because I don't want to lose my voice or mm. was it just such a deep fear? Like, tell, I'm so curious about that part of your yeah. life. So when I say humming, I was not, I had this on, the, I had this chat on the, a podcast the other night and it wasn't like I was dancing down the road, humming a beautiful song. You know, it wasn't that. <laughs> yeah. It was very like, hmm, hmm, that type of stuff. Yeah. And nobody ever said anything to me. So I don't think anybody ever knew I was doing it. Um, and OCD is called a silent condition because we do things where people can't see us doing them. And, and it also, it's a silent condition because it takes an average 15 to 17 years from first symptom to first treatment. And for me, it was 20 oh. years after I was eight. So 28, mm. that I actually walked into a doctor's office and there's 10 years this year um, that I went first, saw the GP and said, I think I've got mental health issues. And from that, I had a psychologist appointment, which then came the diagnosis. Yeah. And, and so, yeah, this was something I lived with for 20 years before I told anyone and, and I've worked out what it was. And even it's only been the last two years or so that I've actively been talking about it openly. Right. So, wow. Right. But yeah, so at, at eight, nobody knew I was humming. Well, that, right. If they did, they, they were just like, Simon's weird. And then we're not going to talk about that. We're not going to even ask him, but yeah, yeah nobody ever, ever knew it. No, yeah, no, not a single question. So, so what was, because it took 20 years for you to start to really understand. And I know for me and, and I, I'll hopefully speak for Margo and correct me if I'm wrong, but for, for Margo and I, like growing up, the narrative for us was like, what's wrong with me. And there was like mm -hmm. a lot of shame, you know, because on the outside, everything looks like typical and everything, but on the inside, it didn't match what we were seeing with our peers. So before the diagnosis and before treatment, like what was your narrative around your experience in the world? Yeah. So I mentioned the, I mentioned eighties and nineties for like a, for a reason and no yeah. phones for a reason. So I, I grew up in the Northern suburbs of Adelaide. So not where I live now. So Adelaide is a, is in South Australia in that part of the, of the world. It's very working class. There's like, it was manufacturing trades, people, um, multicultural, but there's also lots of pockets of welfare as well. Mm -hmm. And so growing up in the eighties and nineties in a time before internet, really before social media, my view of the world was influenced by the people around me. And I grew up in a household of four boys plus dad. It's a very masculine testosterone driven household. We played a lot of sports. So Australian rules, football, um, you know, athletics, basketball, all those types of things. And so I was always around lots of guys in like they were my coaches, some teachers, um, but yeah, my family. And so a lot of guys in my age group come under that, that umbrella of boys don't cry, boys don't show emotion, boys can't talk about their feelings and it's, mm. and, it, and it's feminine or gay to talk about those things. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, and so, yeah, we, I bottled like most guys, I bottled things up and I didn't talk about it. Um, Probably like, and then we've got a huge drinking culture in Australia as well. So 16 years old, it starts to become a bit of a rite of passage to become a man. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of used that as a way to express myself because I was becoming more and more introverted over the years and, you know, be social because social anxiety is a huge thing for me as well. Um, but also numb the pain and, and numb the mm. thoughts and slow things down. So particularly when I became an adult, that became a self-care mechanism. It was, man, my brain's been racing a, a million miles an hour today. I'm going to sit on the couch and have a few beers just to quiet the mind. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so that's kind of like what I did and that's how I showed up. And then I had a few relationships, you know, during my early adult years where maybe I wasn't showing up as the best as I could. Um and, you know, some of the things I might have done might have been fueled by the mental illness. But at the same time, I didn't know I had a mental illness 
you know, we didn't know how to talk about it. It's not even until the last 10 years that we've started talking about mental illness in the community. Yeah. And then it wasn't until my now wife said, Simon, what's going on is not right. You've got to go get some support. You're hurting our relationship. And that was 10 years ago. And then, and then that was the thing that prompted me to actually go and talk about it because before that, there was no mechanism for me to talk about it or even to know what was happening because I'd never heard of mental illness before. It's not something we talked about. Yes. Yeah. We, we can relate. We're eighties and nineties babies. We were both born mm. in the eighties. We can very much relate to what you're saying. It was the same thing in the United States. It wasn't really talked about. And even though, um, girls were allowed to express their emotions more, there was still like shame and embarrassment in expressing mm. a lot right. of different emotions. There was like the too muchness, right? Yeah. It was either you were labeled in one basket or the other. It was either, yeah. Yeah. okay, you're young boys, young men, men, here's your basket of conditioning. Don't talk, <laughs> don't speak up, you know, uh, keep your feelings inside to yourself. Okay, girls, let every feeling you have out, but then you're also going to be judged for that too. It's like, mm. and then, right, we're each being judged differently based on how we were conditioned as as young people and and if you did speak up like as a guy back then you were labeled with adhd yeah mm-hmm. yeah remember right. every, and, any, and girls... any kid in your class who was like a bit like you know just yeah. expressing it like oh he must be on ritalin you know <laughs> yeah. he must, you know he must or be adhd yeah. yeah right yeah. instantly labeled as opposed yeah. to like oh this is a child just speaking up and yeah right yeah, yeah. that's right yeah. I mean, we, I don't know if we could come up with like all the minutes that we spent talking about growing up in the eighties and nineties mm-hmm. on the show. <laughs> it really, it, it's cause it, I mean, we're, we just both Abby and I just turned 40 pretty recently. And so it's shaped us right. Growing up in these decades in our, these were our formative years in this time period. And because as you just said earlier, Simon, no one clearly in any parts of the world or many parts of the world have, have grew up in that time period, talking about mental health, talking about things like anxiety, talking about OCD, you know, and I'm curious, you said that only in the last couple of years, did you really start being comfortable with talking about this stuff? Mm. Like, do you attribute any of that to the pandemic? Was it just your wife kind of calling it out? Like, what would you, what, I don't know. I'm just curious, like, cause yeah. for us, we didn't start podcasting about this stuff until the pandemic, even though we'd been talking about anxiety for a while, even for us, it was pretty recent when we were like really out there with it, but mm. the pandemic made that shift for us. So I'm curious if that played in in any way. Yeah. So it happened around the same time. So it's actually part of my burnout story. So I've got lots of mental health stories, but um, in 2020, so I, I was two years into a master's degree. So it's master's of social work. That's what I am now, a social worker. Um, so I was doing that part-time in the afternoons, evenings, weekends. I was still working full-time in my dated nine-to-five job. We had, you know, two kids under three. Um, and then COVID came along. So, yeah, we went into lockdown for five to six months initially. And then we came out and then we went back in and we did that a few times um and 2020 i experienced burnout so i hit that mental and physical brick wall and i and and even probably spiritual i was just i was a shell of a person and i ended up having to take four three to four months off of work and it was lucky it kind of it coincided with a bit of a break in my study as well so it was i could do it um and as part of that process i was working with a mental health social worker about finding joy in my life and finding purpose again because when you experience burnout you lose these things you lose the joy the purpose and 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 almost like the will to be happy um and so i ended up starting my instagram page which is you know under the mindful men banner um as a daily affirmation thing and trying to Mm -hmm. pet me up and then over time people started to to come on board and then I managed to find the OCD community through Instagram. There's a whole bunch of, like I'd never been on Instagram before. My wife has been telling me for years, oh, you should get on Instagram. It's better than Facebook. And I was like, no, I'm, I'm a Facebook through and through. But um, <laughs> like, yeah, like I came on and found all these OCD pages and I'm like, oh, wow. I didn't know so many people out there experience OCD. Because when we talk about mental illness, we talk about depression. Yeah. And that's pretty much it. Even a little bit anxiety, but mainly depression. Yeah. And so like, I was like really inspired by some of these people telling their stories. I mean, I, had, I heard one story of, of a girl who locked herself in a room for four years. And this is a, an adult because of, you know, her OCD and she couldn't 
walk out that door and I'm like, wow, that's huge. And, and, and then anyway, like part of my recovery burning uh, journey for burnout is I went back to work and I shared my burnout story, but I use that also as a tool to share the OCD story and the depression and the anxiety story, but also the ma- the masculinity story that I've lived with for, you know, since the eighties yeah. and and it, so it just naturally came out as part of that because to, to understand me through burnout, you need to understand me through my OCD, my men, my depression, my anxiety, where sure. I grew up, what how I see the world, you know, the social worker coming out in me. And so it just naturally came out from there. And then I've started my own podcast where I talk about all those aspects and I talk to people across the world about their OCD or, or their depression, their anxiety, their PTSD, whatever it is, yeah. mm-hmm. just as a mechanism, just talk about mental health and it's, and getting into this space where I, I mean, I started a degree because I wanted to work in mental health and, and now I've got my own private therapy practice where I do that. Um, and yeah, so it was just, it was just everything coming out. All my dreams were coming out. Like I finally living my dreams of talking about this stuff openly. And, I, and, you know, I've gone through so much therapy yeah. that talking about mental illness now is quite normal for me kind of like how physical health like a lot of people talk about their physical health really normally yeah sure. most people don't talk about their mental health normally right. like they think it's still taboo so they keep it locked away but you know now i just talk about it and it, it inspires me to get up at you know six in the morning do podcasts or seven in the morning for us today <laughs> yeah um, i would never have done that in my old job because <laughs> it wasn't the kind of thing that lit me up but yeah now it's lighting me up and and it, yeah it was from that that burnout that wow. burnout recovery as part of that I just, I, I love, I love how like our generation, like yay millennials, right? Like (laughs) we are normalizing being human. That's like what was missing Mm. is like, it was like, don't talk about it. Like whatever it was, you know, you have family problems. Don't talk about it. You have friendship or, you know, what don't talk about it. You have emotions. Don't talk about it. Just stuff it down. And I just, Mm. I love like a lot of our guests are, are in the millennial age. Right. And I just, I love how we're all like, no, we are going to talk about it. We are going to normalize it. And it's going to help a lot of people feel uh, like a lot less alone because that's what we've noticed is the more that we talk about it, the more other people talk about it, the more like every time we connect with a guest, Margo and I, like after hanging up, we're like, wow, I feel, I feel seen, even though it's their story, or I feel like I was part of their story because it just takes away that, that piece of shame or aloneness or whatever. So thank you also for just speaking up and talking about it because we just have no idea how much this is helping others that are going through similar situations. Yeah. And so many people that I talk to, they're like, I'm, I always ask, you know, why are you doing this? Why is it important to tell your story? And, And often the response is, I'm being the person that I wish I had when I was growing up, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and it's the same for me. I wished I had someone like me to, to talk to and and someone to help me understand the world. Cause when you're eight and you start doing this thing, like it's scary. And like my, my dad's not someone to talk about things at all. Like he still very much doesn't say hardly boo. Mum's a bit easier to talk to. And I would have gone to mum for most things, but even then, you know, often I wouldn't go to mum because I just stuff it down and bury it. But yeah, yeah, just trying to be this person that I wish I had 30 I years that. ago. Yeah. I love that. It's so beautiful. Thank you for sharing all of that. Um, mm. So talk to our listeners a little bit about how anxiety and you can kind of talk about OCD too, right? Since that seems to be such a large part of your story and your journey, how it kind of manifests itself. You've already shared a little bit about how mm. it's been through the years, but maybe speaking more presently, like lately right how is uh, anxiety or ocd manifesting itself in your mind and your body and your behaviors and things like that yeah so i mean the ocd stuff's still there and and like if i like anxiety like ocd when you get this obsessive thought the anxiety in your body is very similar to an anxiety it's, it's an anxiety disorder so um you know you get the racing thoughts like my brain races like a million miles an hour to the point where if I don't do the compulsions, like I'm trembling all over, I feel sick, um, sweaty, sweaty palms. Um, but perfectionism is a huge part of my life. And, it, and it's probably what contributed to burnout as well um, in the fact that 
to make sure that everything's okay and that the OCD is in check, I would do things and they have to be perfect. They have to be just right. In the OCD world, we say just right a lot, you know, because mm. when I'm touching a door, I have to touch it in a way that it feels just right to be locked. Yes. Um, if that yes. makes any sense at all. Yeah, it, <laughs> one one hundred. I the the door thing is something that I relate so hard to both on when I'm leaving the house and locking the door mm-hmm. and I have to turn it a number of times and push it and yeah. it's no set number, but it's until it feels right that it's locked and I can walk away from it. But even on the inside, when I'm locking the door, when I get home or whatever, I have to turn it and pull and it has to feel I like, it's so relatable. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I once had a door that had a deadlock on it and it was locked. You knew it was locked because the thing would not budge. And that was an amazing period of my life because <laughs> it was easier to check that door, but every other door I had, it had like a little wobble. Yeah. And so like, it's like, did that wobble sound right? I'm not sure. So I'd do it again and do it again. Oh, like I was doing it last night at three o'clock in the morning, you know, and I'm, wow. I'm surprised nobody wakes up. Um, but yeah, like I, I, I long for that door and that deadlock. <laughs> <laughs> does, does thinking about it ever just bring you a sense of peace? Just it imagining does, a secure door. Yeah. And I think next time I build, when we build a house, eventually I'm going to get one with a sol- the most solid door that yes. you've ever <laughs> you've ever met that is, that is self-care like- that is self-care right <laughs> there it's like those little things because otherwise That's it's right. exhausting like checking yeah. the door yeah and so perfectionism has been a huge thing like it's everything has to be perfect like in my bag checking my bag that I've got my wallet phone keys and even my with my work pass when I used to work in my old job was everything's in an order you do it you know wallet phone in that order and and if it's not in the right spot in the bag, then that's you know anxiety provoking again because it has to be in this in a certain spot. Things around the house and around work, like I need things to be done in a certain way. And if they don't, and this is really triggering as a dad when you see your kids doing stuff and you're like, it can't be done in that way. It has to be done in my way because that's the perfectionism coming in, not because they're doing it wrong, and I need to learn to let them you know, let my kids just explore and, and fail if they fail and learn from that and not be that helicopter parent. But like, yeah, like I can find myself saying, no, you've got to do it this way. you got to do it this way. Not because they're doing anything wrong, but because of my OCD is like, yeah. if I don't do this, I'm, I'm going to leave, you know, that my anxiety is going through the roof as well. So, um, and yeah, and it really showed up in my work. So I was 15 years in the public service before I started my social work journey um, doing a lot of desk-based stuff. And so I'd have very regimented ways of seeing the world and doing doing things. And I kind of use my work as my signature. So if you ever got something from me, like a report or an email or something like that, I would try to make it as it would be perfect in my eyes. Um, to the point, like if I got some feedback that it wasn't, it wasn't quite right, I'd be pretty upset internally. I wouldn't let anyone yeah. see that. Um, but over the, as I was getting to burnout, I was unable to keep reaching that perfectionism bar anymore. And that's what contributed to it. Like it was set pretty high for myself, but for others as, others as well. And then it got to a point where I'm just like, what is the point in life? Like, why am I doing this? What's going on? Why can't other people jump up and hit this bar as well? Like what's wrong with the world? Um, and so it's, it's interesting because since I started my social work degree, I've, I've started to embrace this concept of, it's called wabi-sabi, and, and it's this beauty and imperfection. And I'm really trying to take that as part of my practice in social work to go, okay, the world isn't perfect. I, I can't be perfect, and I need to not be perfect as well. My, my psychologist recently said, Simon, you've got to try to fail in some things. Mm to realize that you can get through the anxiety associated with perfectionism and the world will still be okay. Your world will still be okay. And so perfection was a huge, huge one for me, but I mean, other symptoms were like, yeah, the sickness, I'd constantly be in flight mode as Mm -hmm. well. Like I'm a flight kind of guy. I wouldn't, I'm not a fight guy. I'm not a freeze guy. I'm a, I'm running the opposite direction. (laughs) Um, (laughs) And every now and then I'd get, things that would would mimic gastro as well mm. and that triggers me hugely because we had a gastro issue at home when my son was about nine months old and we my wife my son and I all got gastro at the very same time 
and it was the worst 24 hours of our lives because we had no one to lean on and we were just trying to keep this baby alive and and we were running to and from the toilet and nobody could sleep and and my son he could only breastfeed to sleep so when my wife was like trying to breastfeed him and then from over to me and then running to the toilet so every time I get that from my anxiety I'm like oh no we're having another gastro outbreak but my wife's usually like it's probably your anxiety (laughs) that's causing this right now and she's usually right so it wow. does mimic other stuff for sure yeah <laughs> and then your brain starts like or not i won't say you my brain right yes. it's like oh my god am i sick am i gonna be sick now like now i have to prep yeah. for this and it's like wait no maybe it's just the anxiety yeah no like that's happens to me straight away i'm straight to gastro I'm like, yeah. no I and I'm, i get triggered by this this moment in our lives you know Right. That one 24 hour period was yeah. just, yeah. you know, it, it sounds traumatizing. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. It's so interesting. Um, all right. So talk to us a little bit about some of your go-to strategies. So mm. literally this week we spoke to our, another guest who, uh, has an OCD journey and a lot of her story was all about that. And, um, it was another wonderful conversation. Shout, shout out to Christy. Um, but she had told us this fascinating thing that one of her therapists had taught her, which was like to take a picture of something before you leave the house. So like she was freaking out mm. about locked doors and garage doors being closed. And I don't remember all the details, but it was like having the photograph was one of her strategies, right. That kind of helped her help alleviate some of the anxiety that came with it. So mm-hmm. I'm curious, you know, share, with all of our listeners, some of the ways that you um, cope with your anxiety, your OCD, all the things. Yeah. yeah so I mentioned drinking and I, I like to mention that as a not helpful coping strategy yeah. because, you know, a lot of guys particularly, and, and I'm sure there's a lot of girls out there that do the same is like, it is an unhelpful one, <laughs> Yeah. you know, and, and we do it. And it's, it's something that we we're not necessarily happy about doing it, but we do it, do it. So I like to highlight that as, and just recognizing that's why I like, so mindful men, my platform is around being mindful of that stuff. So I'm mindful that I've been drinking too much this, Mm. you know, lately. So I've had a bit of a dry spell. Um, Also, I guess getting diagnosed was huge. Mm -hmm. Actually talking to someone was like, cause bottling it up and trying to figure it out in your head. And in this day and age as well, it's useful that you've got the internet because you can kind of start Googling all this type of stuff, but it's also not helpful to self-diagnose. So actually getting someone to formally diagnose it was was huge. Mm. And from there, it's been 10 years of trial and error. You know, I've done talk therapies. I've done cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, I initially started on the third thought journals and trying to, to combat the thoughts, but it, i found that I was like homework and I didn't like that. So I kind of stopped therapy for a while. Um, But more recently and and finding the Instagram page actually introduced me to exposure response prevention. Mm -hmm. So ERP. So everyone says this is the gold standard for OCD. And so I actually trialed that. I found a therapist in the, on the Sunshine Coast and trialed it because I'd never experienced that before. And, and it was really cool because we could actually trigger some stuff so we triggered the car stuff because we could do that in the daytime because it would be weird that my therapist would be at my home at 11 o'clock at night doing my (laughs) checking routines and but we did the car stuff so we were in the car park and it was a it was it was going to be safe I knew it was going to be safe because it was flat it wasn't on a hill but we purposely took off the handbrake and walked away and left the car unlocked as well because that's another big one and we walked away to the other side of the car park and we didn't look at the car because looking at it is part of my compulsive acts is looking at is physically looking at it. And so that was really like distressing, but we managed to sit through it. So learn to sit through that anxiety and come out the other side and recognize that the anxiety peaks and then we, we can come down on the other side. And so mm. that was useful as well, just to break the cycle of me saying, no, I can't do this. And then from that, we, we did a, an act where I would not look at the car. I would, I would tell myself in the car when I park the car somewhere, like at work, I've checked that, I've checked that, I've checked that. That's the checking. It's only the checking I'm going to do. I'm not, I'm going to get out, lock the car, walk away, and I'm not going to look back. And I did that for a while and it's, that was quite helpful. And it's through this ERP process of processing yeah. what OCD is and how we think about it as well. Um, and little strategies like that. So like, when I check the house at nighttime, I do things in a certain order. So 
part of it was breaking the order. So instead of, you know, going through the lounge room first, I might do the kitchen first or whatever and, and just breaking that up and, and yeah. telling the brain that, that the brain can't control the actions is I can control the actions. And so little things like that um, were really helpful. Um, but mindfulness, so I come back to mindfulness again and, and this is actually from my burnout story more likely, but I, it's, I find it useful for the OCD and the anxiety. So mindfulness, I, I'm really into acceptance and commitment therapy. And that's the practice that I use in my own therapy practice with my clients. Um, and it's around that accepting the emotion or the, the thoughts and the feelings that are coming into our bodies and just not doing anything with it, not doing a compulsive act or anything like that, just sitting with it, mm -hmm. exploring what it does with the body and so forth. And through the burnout journey, I, I discovered mindfulness on the move and I call it mindfulness on the move, but no one told me this was it. Um, and I used to do a lot of walking through burnout recovery. And so I'd go outside and use the five senses to just really tune into where I was because my brain, as I said, it goes a million miles an hour and I'm, I'd, I'd, I'd often be on a different planet when people are talking to me. Like mm -hmm. I could be in this conversation for 15 minutes and talking to you and you wouldn't have no idea that I'm actually thinking about a lot of other things yes yeah <laughs> yep <laughs> and and i'd often you know sometimes i come out of a conversation like i'm not even sure what i said yeah um because i wasn't there right um, it's like wow autopilot worked really well <laughs> like <laughs> yes is this how plays get across the world you know <laughs> but yeah like and so i started mindfulness on the move like in my own little way like of brushing my hand along a tree when i walked past it mm -hmm. if i found that my brain wasn't on the walk because and then I started go oh yeah this is cool and then like it happened to be spring as well so there was more smells in the air and the you know we live in a beautiful part of the world where the sun is just that perfect temperature in spring and 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 just recognizing things and like I I like I, I'm a bit of an artist and I when I draw I like to draw landscape stuff where well, I used to so I used to love looking at the trees on the horizon and them swaying in the in the in the breeze but also looking at the different colors of the leaves as, as you know and. And I started tuning into that stuff a lot more and I could do it on my walk or I could do it in a car if the kids have been screaming for 10 minutes, but I'm not present. <laughs> I, I recognize, I'm mindful, I go, oh, something's happening here. I haven't been present for the last 10 minutes and I just tune into my steering wheel yeah. and the feel of that in my hands. And then that kind of centers me back, you know, bring me back to where my feet are. Mm. And then I can talk to the kids and go, what's going on? Why haven't you been talking? My wife's tuned out, you know, <laughs> she's just looking through her phone or whatever. And I'm like, okay, what's going on? Like I've kind of been on another planet. So mindfulness has been a huge thing. And, and you know, I've tried meditation and things like that. Haven't quite worked because my brain races too much, but mm -hmm. I did find brain training, which is a form of meditation. So it's like a form of guided meditation that you can get it on YouTube for free. And it's kind of like you, you sit down somewhere quiet or lay down somewhere quiet. And it's, it's a sound clip that has like five or six different sounds at the same time. So it could be like running water, a cow. I'm going to bring up a cow again. So a cow bell. We've been talking about cows this morning. Um, a cow bell. It could be um, wind chimes and, and stuff like that. And so what you want to do is you focus on the one sound. And, and it takes you through a guided process. Okay, focus on the wind chimes now. And then focus on, for this next minute, let's focus on the cowbell or whatever. And what it does is it, it takes, it helps the brain just focus and, and yeah. come back to that one point, which could be your kid screaming at you in the car. <laughs> um, and everything else kind of goes away and, and you, you feel more in the moment. And, it, and it, can, it tells the brain that I can control where I put my energy and my thoughts and my power. And so, yeah, that's been a really cool thing as well. And then men's yoga. So I'm going to put something out there for there a lot of guys like, oh, that's a bit hippie. Um, is when I was doing burnout recovery, I went to men's yoga because I couldn't exercise. I had a bit of a back issue as well, which was, which was they couldn't figure out what the back issue, the back, back pain was. And then, but once I got over the mental stuff, like once I started working in here, the back pain just disappeared. Mm -hmm. so it was the connection between mental and physical yeah. and so I, I took myself to men's yoga and I was the youngest guy there by about 10 years and I would often go in there really anxious and worried because of the social anxiety I didn't want to talk to anybody I just wanted to do my thing mm -hmm. and my brain would be racing but what do I have to do all day and then I'd get to a point two thirds in and everything would just drop away 
and I could focus on the breath, focus on my movement. And then we have a nice five minutes at the end where we could just lay there still and, you know, breathe, still do the breathing, but also breathe to the left, breathe to the right, breathe up and down. And it was just a great way just to control the thoughts and, and just let the anxiety just drift away. And it was, I'd walk out feeling amazing. So they're some of the things that I've found. And I like to, to say the men's yoga stuff because, and the mindfulness stuff, because guys will go, man, this guy's a hippie. This guy's just that off, stuff's for know, girls. Off <laughs> yeah, that stuff's for girls, but it really does work. You just got to accept it in your life and just go with it. Because yeah. what have you been doing for the last 20 years? Just drinking too much and getting angry right. or, or whatever, bottling things up. So I'm in that point now where I'm just giving things a go and seeing where it takes me. Yeah. yeah. Which I mean, is so brave, right? It's so brave when we live with anxiety or OCD or dep- whatever it is that trying something new is scary, is challenging, oh, yeah. is hard. You have to get over the mental barrier before anything else and the mind telling you all the reasons why not to. Mm. Um, you are talking to two yoga and mindfulness teachers. <laughs> so oh, we, are, that. There you go. Cool. we are so pro yoga, <laughs> so pro mindfulness. And, and both those practices are what helped us at the beginning as well. Like mm. we were both suffering, you know, um, different, different stages in our life. Um, I had a therapist that recommended for me to try yoga mm-hmm. and mindfulness and like, I mean, that therapist changed my life by introducing me to those practices, right? I mean, he was amazing anyway, but, um, and so like what you're saying, it's like, right. It's like finding what works for you. Seated meditation doesn't work for everybody, especially when all those racing thoughts that are intrusive, that are obsessive, Mm. that want the spotlight. Sometimes it's not that it's like finding what works for you in the movement, in the mindfulness and like anchoring into touching the trees. Like I loved the Mm. way you painted all of that. And, and what I think at the end of the day is right. Mindfulness and yoga is not a gendered thing. They're life skills. We're learning how to self-regulate. We're learning how to focus. I love that thing you said about what was it called? Brain train. Is that what Mm, it is? Yeah. Brain training. Yeah. I want to look that up. That looks amazing. My (laughs) brain needs to practice more focusing. Right. So I love that. And it's like, these are all life skills, how to relax, how to be present how to understand like, like your body has agency, right. And how to Mm. listen to the messages of your body. Like, and so I just love what you're saying. It's like, yeah, yoga and mindfulness is for everyone. And Mm. these are life skills that we can apply outside of the class that support our well being. Yeah, that's right. And I've talked to a lot of people lately about as adults, like, what do you do for fun? And a lot of adults go, I don't know and yeah. you can't point like I couldn't pinpoint it for a long time but now like for me fun is getting out there and being I actually find it fun to be grounded like if I'm grounded and and centered and what's going on I feel better yeah. Yeah, um, exactly. I don't actively go out go I'm having fun I'm going to be grounded like I don't say that but like when I'm in that moment that feels fun I can tune into the kids riding their bikes for example and and not just be on a different planet so yeah it's You're- yeah, you're able to be fun because you practice yeah. being grounded, right? right. Like yeah, thinking about right. that story you told, you know, sitting in the car and it's like, okay, your wife's kind of checked out a little bit, which I imagine then, you know, I, I we're not parents, but we've spoken to many parents and we work with children a lot. And so parents through our work too. And sometimes you just got to turn your mind off and scroll through the phone. Mm. You know, your kids are safe back there and they're back in their car seats <laughs> and it's all good. Like let them scream and work out whatever they're doing. Um, But then that moment when you said like, I'm just going to notice the steering wheel here, right? I'm going to feel the bottoms of my feet. I'm going to get back into my body Mm. so I can be present for my kids and say, okay, actually what's going on back there. Right. And what a gift that you're offering them, uh, when eventually maybe you're going to start talking to them about this stuff. Sometimes dad feels really disembodied. You know what I like to do Mm. sometimes, you know, I like to grab my steering wheel and feel the sensation of squeezing it really tight and then releasing it or like whatever it is you're, you know, that you're using in that moment to help you ground and center. That's the gift that again, Mm. things that we didn't get as children and young adults that now we're hoping to change that for the children and the next generation in our lives. Um, Yeah. And everything I'm doing is, is for my son. I, I, I look at myself and and my daughter as well, but mainly for my son, because I want him to grow up not bottling things up for for 20 years. I want him to be able to express it 
particularly as a guy um, and have a good relationship with me, even though my mental illness gets in the way sometimes and we can be vo- both very stubborn <laughs> and, and see our own and not come come together. But yeah, like I, I'm doing it a lot for him so that he mm. can grow up in a generation where it's okay to talk. And it was never a question about who you are as a guy. It's just a natural thing. Yeah. Yes. It'll just be a natural thing. Yeah. yeah. I love that. Um, all right. So if you could go back in time, just jump in a time machine and speak to a younger version of yourself, talk to a younger Simon, what kind of advice would you offer? Probably to punch that kid in the head. <laughs> <laughs> Not myself, but the kid no, that told kid me that, that I that couldn't talk. That. Yes. <laughs> the kid that got you on the humming train. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wouldn't do that. I'm not a violent person. So, um, yeah, I would, I would never have done that. I'm, I'm, that's not me. But to talk, to we tell, can relate to the rage. We, yeah, we can. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's hard to tell my young, my, like my really, like my eight year old self or even my teenage self, because teenagers don't listen to anybody. But I think more for like the young adult me is to just go and get help, go mm. and talk to a doctor. Because at that point, you kind of start understanding the world a bit. I mean, it wasn't until my late 20s that I could start to go, okay, I need help. But not until my even my late 30s that I can actually really understand my position within the world and how the world is influencing me. And that's come from my social work degree, really, mm. is being able to look at that type of stuff. So I think it's just at some point in your life is just to to notice that it's whatever's happening inside. It's okay to talk about things. It's okay to be on meds. So medication was something that held me back for a couple of years before I went and saw that doctor because I saw it as a, as a taboo thing. I saw that as a stigma thing. I didn't want to go and talk about mental health because I didn't want to be on medication. Yeah. And it held me back. But then I kind of got over that eventually. And I've been on medication pretty much the last 10 years. There was a period where I could come off because things are really good. And I'm like, awesome. I'm on top of this. But then there was a period after that where I'm like, no, I need to go back and get stuff again because things are are derailing. So um, I think they're the two things is, yeah, get help. um, Talk about it. It's okay. But medication is not the end of the world if you do need to go on medication. But at the same time, there's other things as well you can do, not just medication, like self-care, activity, you know, exercise and nutrition and sleep are huge three that we often um, that are often falling out the window when we live with mental illness. So if you can yeah. get those right initially, you might not even need to go and see a doctor and get on meds because there they could be three, th- three things and the alcohol as well. How much are you drinking? So mm. yeah. Okay. Yeah. I I love that. Like the get help. Right. And it's okay. It's okay to ask for help. It's okay to Mm. receive help because I, I think that a lot of, of people, um, myself included, like just forget that it's okay. It's not a weakness. It's not even really that vulnerable, although it feels vulnerable, right. Mm. To ask for help and to receive help. And I, I think that for, for some men, it's more of a barrier right? Mm. We all have to have it all together. And so I just love that piece of advice. Just And it's part help. of that normalizing mental health. Cause like if like, and I grew up playing sports. So if we tore a hamstring at football, the first You'd thing was like, I'm going to go see a doctor to <laughs> yes. get my hamstring. Cause I want to get back on the field. Yes. You know? I want to play. I don't want to be the guy that's sitting on the, on the pine for the six weeks because I don't do a recovery process. Right. And they normalize that. They joke about mm-hmm. that. Like, oh, look, Simon, you got so high and then you fell down and crunched your neck. And that was so funny, like looking back on it. <laughs> but so just do that with your mental health because yeah. a doctor and a psychologist or counselor, like now I'm, I'm a social worker doing this stuff. You can see people like this who are trained and know what they're talking about. And, and the thing is, like when we live with mental illness, particularly OCD, is that we think we're the only person in the world who's ever experienced that particular thing. And I had this recently where I was having... Um, these intrusive thoughts around harm OCD so uh, holding a knife for example and I was like oh what happens if I accidentally stab my kids or my wife and I've never really experienced this before and and I kept that bottled up I'm like no I'm going against the grain of who I am now I'm like so I told my wife she's like okay that's not good but you need to go see a doctor and the reason I didn't tell my wife because I was worried that she was going to take the kids and run at the Mm, house right and then I went, yeah. I, and then I was hesitant to go see the doctor because I was worried that they were going to call child safety and, and child right. safety would take my kids. And and because Simon's, you know, erratic and he's, he's thinking about stabbing people. Right. OCD tells you that you're the worst person in the world 
but you're not. You don't believe these things. You don't want to do the acts. They just, they just happen as part of the anxiety management process. Right. And so talking to your GP or talking to a psychologist, they've likely heard all these stories before. And all of a sudden by you telling it and then finding communities, whether it's on Instagram or, or through podcasts as well, you can realize, yeah, I'm not alone. Like other people in the world are humming because they think they're going to lose their voice. Right. You know, right. That type of stuff. So right. just talk about it, normalize it because it is a normal thing. It's part of our bodies. So. Right. Right. I mean, intrusive thoughts, like they are rough, they are rough, but there's nothing wrong with us just because we're having mm. really horrible thoughts, right? Like we're yeah. not acting on them and we can talk about it and get help for those. So yes, thank you. So, so yeah. well said. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I just got, I don't know, something about you sharing that just gave me like full body chills. I just feel like it isn't talked about and normalized enough. The dark thoughts that come into our, into most people's minds and they aren't willing to, I mean, it's, and it's so powerful that you, you knew that at the end of the day, you were safe to share that with your wife. Right. And that Mm. she probably wasn't going to grab your kids and run away because, you know, she's watched you care for yourself for the past, for, for, for the longest time. Right. And so, um, just knowing that like, we're not a burden, uh, going through something, experiencing something extremely challenging, isn't burdensome. Right. And it's maybe a burden to you. It may start to, you know, worsen if you don't address it. And so it's like imagining you, you know, out on the field and you get that severe injury. And what if you Mm. just keep fighting through it? Eventually (laughs) something's going to break and you're going to never be able to play again. Right. And so what would, ha- what would have happened if you didn't address it in that moment? And so it's yeah. just so powerful. It's a powerful reminder that like, we're not a burden and that when we are going through something physical, mental, whatever it is you deserve, we all deserve and are worthy of help. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Amazing. Yeah. Okay. Before we jump into some lightning round fun, we like to ask all of our guests to share how they would define the phrase anxiety warrior. We see ourselves as anxiety warriors here on this show. That's why we named the podcast anxiety <laughs> warriors podcast. And so we love um, hearing from all of our warrior guests, uh, how they would define this phrase. So what does being an anxiety warrior mean to you? Um, I think it means strength and resilience. So often when we live with mental illness, we don't feel strong and we don't feel resilient. But what I often do with, the, with my clients, for example, is that whatever you're going through today, if it was something that's similar that you went through, so say, for example, a relationship breakdown and you know the, the anxiety and depression that might come from that. And then you go, okay, well, have you had any other relationships in your life where things haven't worked out? Yeah. Okay. What did you do to get through that? You know, it could have been, oh, I started exercising again. I started, you know, joining social groups. It could be that I went and saw, spoke to someone. And, and these are res- resilient factors. They are. They're factors that, you know, that highlight what we're good at. We're, we, we're problem solving people and that we can use that to our advantage and get and, and use that as strengths for us to move forward. So, so to be an anxiety warrior is that because we've probably been doing it for a very long time is that we are resilient. We know how to get through rough periods as well. So for me, like that intrusive thought around the knife thing, I knew from my experience that going and talking to someone was a, is, is a resilient factor for me. It's a strength yes. because I can talk about it and then I can get help and, and guidance as to how to address that particular issue. So it's really around that strength and resilience and remembering that we all are strong and all are resilient. And it's just about tuning into that and recognizing that you will get over this period if it's a hard period for you and you'll come out the other side and then you'll probably go through it again, but you've got the tools in your toolkit to be able to manage that when it happens. So, yes. Oh, full body chills. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so many twinkles. I was, oof. Oh. We, I mean, obsessed with it. I, I love hearing this, these responses from all of our guests. It's just, it's just amazing. Yeah. Thank you. All right. So this was a very up and down kind of a roller coaster conversation. You know, there was some mm-hmm. laughs, there was some high moments, some like, you know, deep and introspective moments, but now it's time to play because anxiety is kind of heavy and we like to end before we, um, you know, hear about your work and where our listeners can connect with you with just kind of getting down in the mud and playing a little bit and having some fun with some lightning round questions. So Simon, are you ready for 
lightning round. <laughs> I love it. Yes, lightning. let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay uh so just so you know that last that last yeah. lightning that was a that's brand new, new. That's we're new. testing out our yeah. like made up stings for the yes. podcast <laughs> super high tech over here um perfect <laughs> uh, if, if you need any tips for how to you know enhance your podcast yeah just Sound Do you need us singing in the background? Oh. We're here. We got you. <laughs> I, I probably got some sponsored, some spots, sponsored segments for my podcast. Yeah, we'll look into it. Yes, for sure, for sure. Okay, <laughs> so Abby and I are just going to go back and forth and ask you some a handful of fun, get to know you type questions. You ready? Mm -hmm. Yep. All right, Abby. All right, go? yeah, I'll first? go first. Woo! So I see a guitar behind you. Mm -hmm. Is that your guitar? That is my guitar. Okay. What <laughs> is like your go-to song that you will play? Like you pick up the guitar and someone's like, hey, play us a song. What's the go-to song you would do? Uh, be Nothing Else Matters by Metallica. Ooh. Nice. All right. You had that answer in the canon. Yeah, that was, <laughs> that was it. It was go-to. <laughs> okay. Can you sing us a few bars or um, just kidding? Or maybe I'm not. <laughs> oh, if I had a few drinks, maybe, but it's seven o'clock, eight o'clock in the morning. So not you yet. just spent an hour telling our guests <laughs> never to drink. No, I mean, maybe not never. But... <laughs> I didn't say never. I still like to drink, but Fair yeah, just recognizing, yeah. yeah. My us, us too. Us too. Yes, it is. It is what eight a.m. over there by you. Yeah. So it is eight. Yeah. Yeah, that's maybe not the best call, but okay. Uh -huh. Um. All right, that's a good song. Good answer. Okay, what is the dorkiest thing about you? Mm. Oh, everything. Like I'm into Pokemon at the moment because my son's into Pokemon. It just reminds me of Pokemon at high school. So yeah, nice. we're, we're reading Pokemon books all the time and watching kids on YouTube open Pokemon packets. And yeah. Oh my God. What people what do on moment. YouTube? I don't understand. <laughs> yeah. I don't that's really understand. cool. Like what are they going to get? What are they going to get? Like, yeah. Does anyone want to watch me open packages? Can yeah. you get some sponsors? If <laughs> I like, don't you know. I know. Wow, Don't worry. Okay. He, he wants to come. He's been on my podcast and he wants to come on again and do an episode where he's, we're opening a packet of Pokemon cards. So I'm looking right. forward to that. <laughs> there you go. Reach out to the Pokemon people. Be like, hey, you know, also talk about mindfulness for men and all this other stuff. But but sometimes my kid opens Pokemon. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> love I it. Love that. Okay. All right. I'm going to what is something that is no longer around. I don't even know what I would answer for this, but what is something that's no longer around, but like from the eighties or nineties that you wish was still a thing? That door with that deadlock would be fantastic. <laughs> 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 uh, I would actually, if, if you think about it, like, I would love it, that time before technology, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. to be able to not sit on my phone. Like I've got two phones on my desk right now, one for work, one for, for, personal but just remembering those days where we used to go out at 6 a.m in the morning play outside all day and come home when the when it's 6 p.m at night like yeah not, we don't really do that anymore so yeah those days and i'm not a camper but i, I imagine that what's that's what camping experience is like so maybe i need to get into camping or something <laughs> okay yeah right just like i say that all the time i'm like i just want to live off the grid i'm over it yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it really changed it. Like, I mean, the way from like, for me, it was like middle school when AOL first started happening <laughs> and just, you know, from, from middle school till now, it's like really crazy how we're always on our phones. We have mm. email, right? Like all the time we've lost because of the technology that's in our pocket. Yeah. And I blame snake for a lot of guys <laughs> loving video games. So, and then snake <laughs> too, like when you can go snake. outside this when you can go snake two, you can go outside one side and come back the other side. That was just mind Forget blowing. it. Hours, <laughs> hours of fun. Oh my God. I love it. Okay. Yeah. All right. So let's see. I'm choosing between a couple right now. Okay. If you could eliminate one thing from your daily routine, what would it be? Oh, OCD would be fantastic. <laughs> just eliminate the, wouldn't that be so nice? All the checking and. <laughs> yeah. That, Fair enough. That would be number one. Yeah. All right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. My final question. Um, well, so, okay. So you're in Australia mm -hmm. and I, I love Australia. I've been there once in 2006 and I, you know, I did a little Sydney, a little Byron Bay, 
I never mm -hmm. made it to the Wit Sundays. Um, but if someone was coming to Australia for like a day, like what would be like the must see thing you think someone should enjoy about Australia? Um, I would say, and, and I'm sorry for anyone in New South Wales or Victoria, but don't go to those places. <laughs> like, go anywhere but like there's so much of the of the country that people don't go like you, you know you said byron bay everyone goes to byron bay but yeah go somewhere just because go somewhere completely random mm. and just do because there's so many cool things to do like where we are on the sunshine come to the sunshine coast and have a coffee with me and and you know <laughs> go see the big pineapple or you know we've got a big pelican as well that you can go see everything's big here like we've got these big ah. statues of random things um big pineapple yeah, I yeah. love the big pineapple. <laughs> yeah. Um, and just, yeah, just go somewhere other than the big two, like mm -hmm. Melbourne or Sydney. Yeah, just go do something different. Love it. Yeah. All right. Final question. What's one thing before you became a parent that you swore you would never do <laughs> as a parent, but now you do it? <laughs> That's good. Absolutely everything. <laughs> We often laugh about this, like all the things that we said we weren't going to do when we became a parent, we're suddenly doing pretty much. Um, <laughs> Everyone says it. it's so good. It's fun. I find myself because I'm trying to be this new age dad, and, and I'm like, so trying to, like, we we were smacked when we were kids, and and all this type of stuff, and yelled at, and that was discipline. But I find myself saying, "Stop yelling!" and I'm yelling at the same time. <laughs> 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 to my kids so that's something I'm like this isn't working whatever's happening right now isn't working so I, I think that's something I need to work on yeah <laughs> I feel like many many parents can are just nodding along yes like, yeah, that's a good <laughs> one good one <laughs> yeah. awesome oh my gosh well thank you so much for getting down in the mud with us and playing yeah. for a little bit Simon those were yeah. those were some great insights into into who you are um <laughs> so before we have you share a win of the week because we like to ask mm -hmm. all of our guests to share their win, whether it be big or small. Tell our listeners how they can connect with you. Yeah. So if you're in Australia and you're looking for therapy support, so I do um, therapy as a social worker, um, you just look me up on my website. So it's www.mindful-men.com.au and it's got my services there. So I have a dedicated men's mental health business called Mindful Men and it's dedicated men because men struggle to talk and I'm a man yeah. so you know I can help in that area um, but that also has links to my socials as well so I'm on mindful.men.aus on Instagram Facebook um, I've got a podcast the mindful men podcast as well that people can hear my story but also stories around the world and and yeah they're the primary areas but the website's the easiest one because it's got all those links and and stuff Perfect. like that so all right awesome yeah. thank you all right Simon so share with us a win of the week, something big or small that happened this week or just recently that felt like a win for you. Yeah. So, I mean, anxiety is a huge thing for me and social anxiety. So this week I've been putting myself out there quite a bit doing networking for the business, trying to get it up and running. So we had a mental health fair in Marichador here and I had a stool where I was standing there for three hours talking about mindful men for three hours, which was quite anxiety provoking in <laughs> itself and, and exhausting. But then I've been going to all sorts of coffee meetups and morning teas and just getting out there and talking about mindful men, trying to drum up business and, and connect with people. So I'm really, I'm exhausted. Like now, like <laughs> I, I went to bed at like six o'clock last night. I was so <laughs> tired. And, um, but it's all, it's all worthwhile because a, it's connecting with my community and, and telling them and talking about mindful men, but also just talking to people about mental health. So it's something I'm really proud of at the moment, even though it's, absolutely exhausting at the moment as well so <laughs> wow that's awesome what a huge win yeah yeah I mean that's the thing it's like with social anxiety it's like it takes that extra layer mm. of effort and energy and everything and that's such a that's such a huge win so yeah no I'm pretty Amazing. proud of it and my wife keeps saying that as well so yeah that's just nice yeah at the yeah yeah it's like, hey, I can still do this even with anxiety mm. right beside yes. me telling me I'm being weird. You know, it's <laughs> <That's> right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You're talking so too much. You're not talking enough. Wait, now are you looking in their eyes? Are you looking yeah. too much? You know, <laughs> <laughs> don't stare directly in their eyes. <laughs> yes. I love it. Uh, yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> It's awesome. Big win. It's a fantastic <laughs> win. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, Simon, for being a guest on our show. It's been just a true pleasure. 
Yes, thank you. No, I've, I've really enjoyed coming on and sharing my story and, and talking to you guys. You guys are hilarious. So um, <laughs> I love it. I love it. Us All too. Right. <laughs> Thanks, Simon. Have a good Bye. one. <laughs> Woo, warriors, what a conversation. Mm-hmm. I mean, obsessed. I, I'm always, again, we're broken records. We are broken records. We're obsessed with every conversation because every conversation is incredible. We just are the luckiest anxiety warriors on planet earth that cool people who have interesting uh, stories to share choose yeah. to do so on our show. And we can cut through the small talk. Yes. We just get right to it so we can see each other's humanity. That's why, you know, I think that's why it's always so amazing because we get to like not talk about the weather, right? And dive right into like, yeah. hey, this is my story. This is part of who I am, right? Mm-hmm. I, I I love it. Yeah, I agree. This is such a good conversation. Again, someone we've never met before until today and he's amazing. Yeah. From a different part of the world. Yeah. Waking up I think- early? I would never wake up early. Wake up early to talk about mental health. Like, that's amazing. I've done it a couple of times, but it is jarring to do it super early in the morning. So I yeah. appreciate We appreciate you, Simon, for waking up early to chat with us about mental health. But clearly he's so passionate about it, right? And so yeah. it probably just feels so organic and natural and fun for him. And he certainly behaved as as such on our, on our you know, during our chat. So yeah. Um, I think my first big takeaway from our conversation is just how a person of a, of the opposite gender who identifies as the opposite gender, right. Mm -hmm. Uh, from a different part of the world, but grew up at the same time that we did Mm -hmm. shared so much of our childhood experiences. Right. And I felt, it felt like a very nostalgic conversation, not just for some of the references that he made to pop culture things that were pretty much worldwide back in the day in the eighties and nineties, but also just with his journey with mental health, right. How it wasn't yeah. discussed, how, um, there was stigma attached to it, you know, mm-hmm. and he spoke obviously from a, from a perspective as a male about, um, what it was like to grow up in a place where drinking was part of the culture and, um, just the, just the stigma surrounding right. keep it all inside. Yeah. Don't speak about, right. about your stuff, about your anxiety, about your OCD, about men, or even understand it. Don't even attempt to understand mm-hmm. it because it's not manly. Right. Um, and so once again, it's just like, I felt connected, but also I feel like I'm always learning so much yes. Yes. from our guests, you know? Yeah. 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 I mean, part of my takeaway kind of ties into that. Like, um, first of all, I really appreciated how right off the bat, he just defined OCD, right? Because mm-hmm. I think the term OCD gets thrown around a lot. And I said that in our conversation, like people are like, oh, I'm so OCD. But to really break it down into the obsessive thought followed by the compulsive act, right? And then right. the disorder is like the duration. Um, mm-hmm. Really just gave my mind some like, like just, I don't know, just put my mind at ease for like the rest of it. Cause it's like, okay, this is how he defines it. And now we have a common language, right? Right. A common understanding. Yeah. Right. Because it's a word that can be used so much. Right. But part of my takeaway also is like, I I don't know how to like fully say what I'm going to say, but, but for so long I've known like, okay, like anxiety is a spectrum. Right. And we all have different experiences on the spectrum of anxiety. Like it's not a one size fits all. Mm -hmm. Um, And same with depression. Depression is a spectrum. And again, we all might have different symptoms when experiencing depression. Um, And and it's not just, again, oh, you just can't get out of bed for three weeks and that's depression. Right. So. Right. But I think that before this conversation, I still had some misunderstandings about OCD. And I feel like my takeaway is just OCD is a spectrum too. And I never, I don't know why I never thought of that. Right. And he had very like shortly, like mentioned about the girl who was in her room for like four years dealing with OCD versus like people who can go out and work and stuff, but you just don't know what's working on their mind on the inside. And I think that when I used to think more about OCD, I thought it was more debilitating and harder to function in society because I, Mm. I remember like TV shows where like someone had to tap a faucet like an X amount of times in the nineties. 
And so I think for so many years, I've been looking at OCD through that lens of what I learned in the nineties. Right. And so, but at the same time, both with Simon's conversation and with our previous guest, Christy, I relate to so much and I'm not diagnosing myself with OCD, but Mm -hmm. like I can so, so relate. And so I guess, you know, my takeaway is just, I've learned so much more about OCD, you know? Yeah. I just, I didn't even think about it and piece it together until you just said it too. It's like my understanding of OCD was really limited. Yeah. And it was like, not that I guess I was ever really trying really hard to understand it either. Right. And it's like, maybe that's part of the problem too. And I think it's just maybe that a lot of folks just to be kind to myself or anyone out there, that's like, Oh, I'm not necessarily thinking hard about things that I don't deal with on the regular. Right. And so it's easy for people like Simon, like Christy, for anyone with diagnosed OCD where it really impacts their day-to-day functioning. Um, to have it on their mind all the time. Right. Mm-hmm. It's like, I think about my anxiety all the time because I live with anxiety and it's here all the time. And so, but like my husband, Adam doesn't think about anxiety all the time because he doesn't have it in the way that I do. Right. And so yeah. I kind of had this aha moment when you were talking to, it's like, um, when you mentioned spectrum and you brought up that story that you told about the, um, the girl that was in her room for four years or whatever, and how that's obviously very different from his experience. It made me think about, um, Darius too. And Darius talked about agoraphobia, right. And how many mm-hmm. different layers of that, um, and how it can change over the course of your life. Right. Cause right. Simon's 39 and he talked a lot several times in our chat about how for a few years, this one thing, it was like this, right. And then for the next few years, it was like this, like when he was talking about medication, it was like, well, I needed it for a while and then I didn't need it anymore. And then a few years went by and okay, I need it again. Right. And so just remembering that, like, even for people that suffer with the same type of, you know, um, mental issue for say 39 years of their life, um, they may are going to go through ups and downs with it. Right. They're going to experience it, uh, in different ways, in different periods of their life. Right. He talked a lot about burnout and, the fact that he's only been talking about his OCD for the past couple of years and how maybe the pandemic contributed to that a little bit. Um, mm-hmm. And so just remembering that too, like, okay, even when we're suffering with something for a really long time or dealing with something, I should say, that doesn't mean that it's exactly how it was last year or 10 years ago or whatever. It's like, I've had anxiety my whole life, but has it been the same? No, it's no. changed. Right. So um, I think my other, my, my final big takeaway is just how many strategies Simon seems to um, be able to have in his tool bucket, right? Yeah. Just the level of um, trial and error and, and the willingness to experience different modalities of dealing with anxiety, with OCD, with, with all the things is really um, admirable. And I know you said too, it's like, it, it's how brave is it to be able to say, Hey, this one thing isn't working right now, but right. I know I can get through it because I have all these other things. Mm -hmm. Um, and he mentioned community a few times, and I feel like it's been a little bit since one of our guests has really talked about the impact of community. It always comes up even briefly, but I really felt in our, in our short conversation that every time he brought up not feeling alone and finding the people on Instagram and groups on social media and stuff, you could, I felt like this lightness in him almost yes. that he just, you could tell it's like, he'd been burdened with this for so long and feeling alone in it. And so what an incredible gift to be able to have found his community online. Right. right. And like, you know, we were joking about technology and how it's <laughs> changed our lives for better or for worse, but that part's for better. Right. Right. Because it helps us find our community and it helps us maybe find more understanding on ourselves and our experiences. Yeah. Um, You know, my final takeaway is really, and again, it was only briefly mentioned, but I think it's just so important and so valuable is him highlighting the intrusive thoughts. Um, Um, And you and I both commented like how we, we both think like, yeah, it hasn't been spoken about enough because, you know, the thoughts that can pop into your head can be I'll say my head, I'll say mine, because I only know my intrusive thoughts, Um, horrible thoughts, horrible thoughts that I never want to say out loud, that I never want to share with other people. And you're nodding along as I say this. So Uh it's obviously relatable. Like intense nodding. Yeah. And like for so many years, you know, I hid that stuff. I hid it. And, and 
I just would wonder what's wrong with me. What's wrong with my brain? Why would, why would I have these thoughts? Where do these thoughts come from? And I just think like, I just, the, my, my takeaway is just one feeling grateful that he brought that up. Mm. Right. Because again, things can only, we can only feel less alone when people share their experiences, when we understand there's nothing wrong with us and other people share the same thing. Mm -hmm. Right. And so my, my, my takeaway is one is just gratitude for him bringing it up, but also just normalizing it. Right. That we all have intrusive thoughts. Some of us might have more, some of us might have less and Mm -hmm. what to do with that is talk to someone, Mm -hmm. right. There's no shame. There's, there's no, nothing wrong with having them. Um, and it probably helps a lot more by speaking them to a safe person who won't judge you to help you work through them. Um, and so that was my, my second takeaway is just really, um, appreciating the normalizing of intrusive thoughts because we all have them and they're really hard and uncomfortable, but we're not alone in them. Yes. Having them. Oh yeah. I'm so glad you brought that back up too, because I mean, it's always so hard to narrow down the takeaways. It's because yeah. there's so, there's such richness in each of our conversations with our warrior guests. And we're obviously so grateful to have them and, and hear from them, but yeah, that was a really powerful moment that happened towards the end of our conversation. And I'm just grateful to you for rebringing it up because yeah. I do feel like hopefully our warrior listeners are going to be able to have that better understanding of like, Ooh, it's okay. It's human to have some of those thoughts. And, right. Right. And we can seek the help that we need yes. if, if those thoughts are really getting to us. Right. 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 Yeah. Oh, thank you, Simon, so much for being a guest on our show and um, to all of you warriors for being with us and listening. If you'd like to connect with us for any reason, you can jump on over to Instagram. We're at anxiety warriors podcast, or you can shoot us an email at anxiety warriors podcast at gmail.com to shout out your wins of the week, um, to offer some topic ideas, things mm-hmm. you'd like to hear us chat about here on our show. Or if you think you would be a great fit as a guest on our podcast, please reach out. Let's talk about your story and, um, figure out a way that we can help share it with the world via our platform, Mm -hmm. jump into our show notes and check out our merch, uh, store where we're selling some just amazing anxiety warriors podcast, merch, coffee mugs, and t-shirts and hoodies. And it's getting chilly here Mm -hmm. in the U S in most States. And so grab yourself something great for this upcoming season. Maybe start thinking about the holidays. You know, if you buy gifts for the holidays, might want to get your anxiety warrior friends and family, something fun that they can sport, uh, sport. And you're supporting a show. That's right. And you're supporting us and our work and, um, helping to increase the conversation around mental health and anxiety mm-hmm. awareness and all that good stuff. And please, if you can take five seconds and smash that five-star rating on Apple, or Spotify or wherever you tune in, leave us a review. If you love our show, please leave a review. It has been like since July, like a long time. Come on, come on. Give us a review. It takes two seconds. People smash that five stars. You're listening right now. Pull out your phone, hit the five stars if you haven't yet. And then say, thanks. So we can say, yay, we got a new review. Yeah. Just think about how happy that you'll make Abby and myself. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, All right. And uh, did I say like and subscribe to our YouTube channel? Maybe you did now. I did it now. Boom. Yeah. Nailed it. Those are all the things. Those are no more notes. (laughs) That's the end, (laughs) y'all. So thank you all so much for going on this journey with us. We are so grateful we get to do this with you. Till next time.